Hi, my name is Dr. Lucy Henshaw. I'm the intensive care specialist looking after Leah today. I'm Joe, Leah's partner. And I hear you have a little girl? Yeah, Maya, 18 months old. She's a really good friend of ours. I'm Hannah, Leah's sister. I'm Peter, Leah's father. I'm so sorry there's been a delay in talking with you. Let me give you an update now. Leah has suffered what we call an extradural hematoma, which is a blood clot on the surface of the brain, usually caused by a bang to the head. Now, a blood clot on the surface of the brain causes pressure in the skull. That's why we're in such a hurry to get Leah into the operating theatre after she collapsed. Wait, are you telling me that if you have bleeding in your brain that the operation needs to be done as soon as possible? For this kind of bleed, yes. And yet they let her go home. I knew there was something going on. She wasn't right. She wasn't herself. Why did they let her leave? I'm sorry, Joe. I, I think you're right. Leah should not have been allowed to leave the hospital. A mistake has been made, and I do need to talk to you and your family about that. So are you saying that the delay in getting the scan might affect her recovery? It is possible, Joe. What the fuck? Somebody makes a mistake, lets her go home, and now she could be left severely damaged as a result? What about Maya? Maya needs a mum. I, I fully appreciate your anger, Joe, and I'm very sorry for what has happened. Who the hell is this emergency doctor? I want to know who they are. His name is Dr. Chris Hicks. I want to see him. He needs to tell me to my face why he let this happen. Couldn't he see she was acting strangely? Oh, fuck! Hello, everybody. Thanks for meeting me again this morning. Uh, I think you know everyone except for Jennifer McKay. Jennifer is the neurosurgical specialist who's been looking after Leah. And I'd like you to meet Stephen. Stephen is a senior nurse who has experience in supporting families who were in a situation such as yours. It's been such a difficult two weeks. How are you all coping? Oh, I'm not sure that I am coping with it. Um, I'm either crying or losing my temper with people. Uh, Maya keeps asking where her mummy is and I don't know what to say. Yesterday she asked if we could go out looking for mummy in case she was lost. I'm sorry, that must be so... <laughs> sorry, I'm... I'm getting a bit upset. Um, we are all really sad with your situation. Now I have to go through what has happened over the last few hours. I'm very sorry to say that despite everything we have been doing, Leah's condition has gotten worse overnight. But, but why is this happening now? I mean, she had the operation to remove the blood clot and relieve the swelling, so. That's right, Hannah, and the operation was successful. Well, it hardly seems successful now, does it? I'm sorry, that didn't come out the way I wanted it to, so um, let me try again. There's no easy way to say this. Jennifer and I have spoken about Leah this morning, and we think she's going to die. Is there anything of the last conversation that you'd like me to explain? No, thanks, Lucy. You were very clear and considerate. We, uh, we understand the situation. If it's okay with you, I'd like to get Stephen now to go through with you about the next steps. Are you ready for that? Yeah, I think so. It's been good to hear you give your thoughts on Leah for the last few minutes. I feel like um, I've got to know a 
a little bit more about her, which will help me to assist you through the next steps. Uh, firstly, I think we should consider Maya. Sarah's offered to help make a memory box uh, with photos of Maya, with Leah, some, some handprints and a, a lock of Leah's hair. She explained that this might be helpful for Maya later in her childhood. You know. I would like to touch on something that we haven't talked about yet. There is a possibility that Leah may be able to become an organ donor. Yeah. I'm sorry, Peter, I can see that I've upset you. Um, it, it's not uncommon for families to feel surprised and upset when, I, when we raise the topic of organ and tissue donation. But very often, families haven't discussed the subject. Actually, we have talked about it, Peter. Leah signed up on the Order Donor Registry. I don't know. I just don't want her to suffer anymore. Okay, Peter, this must be very hard for you. Um, we're talking about your daughter after all. I trust you, Joe. And I know Leah loves you very much. You know best what she would want. Thanks, Peter. It's what she wanted. What can I say? We have difficult conversations in critical care. My name's John Gatwood, and this is Sim Story Part 3. What you've just seen is a selection of clips from three difficult conversations that occurred in the intensive care unit during the care of Leah, who we've been following this week. The first was an open disclosure conversation where Leah's family were told by the intensive care specialist that Dr. Hicks had made an error when he allowed her to leave the emergency department without the proper imaging or assessment. The second, two weeks later, was an end-of-life discussion where Leah's family were told that her condition had worsened and that she was dying. The third conversation was a family donation conversation where Leah's family agreed to uphold her wishes and proceed with organ and tissue donation. You know that this session, just before lunch, on the day after the smack dinner, is the graveyard shift, right? Well, now you know why. These conversations are much, amongst the most challenging things that we do in critical care. I'd like you all to take just a moment and think back to the most challenging, the most difficult conversation you've ever had with a family. Are you there? If you're anything like me, you'll be thinking, I was out of my depth there. I was poorly prepared. I could have done better. The family deserved better. Now, we know that good communication skills improve outcomes for families by decreasing depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and by improving satisfaction and decision-making. In organ donation, we know that if you're trained in the family donation conversation, you get higher consent rates. But more importantly, the percentage of durable decisions is increased, and that's decisions that families are still comfortable with six months down the track. So we need to get it right. Unfortunately, it seems that we often fall short, with up to 30% of families reporting dissatisfaction and several studies that show that families remember less than half of what we tell them. So I'm passionate and curious about how I can improve the conversations I lead and how we can teach others to lead them. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to give you a few insights from my career as a healthcare communicator and simulation educator to show you how we can become more comfortable with these conversations and how we can use simulation to help with that. This is me looking a lot younger during my early days as a simulation educator. It was about that time I started to be let loose on family discussions in the ICU. I wasn't very good at it. 
I was nervy, and I talked too much. Over the years, I've done a lot more simulation debriefing, because I was a terrible debriefer to start with. And I now am working with Donate Life Australia to help organ donation specialists lead the family donation conversation using simulation and in workshops. In this program, we trained over 100 organ donation specialists to lead these discussions using real anonymized cases, professional actors, and a three-stage debriefing process. Firstly, with the family staying in character. Secondly, with the actors coming out of character. And thirdly, with video debriefing. The participants reported that what they valued most was the realism of the scenarios and being debriefed by the families in character. Almost all of them reported that they felt more comfortable and confident with these conversations going forward. For me, I learned a lot about communication skills and about debriefing. And this is where I had a little bit of an epiphany. I began to realize that leading a family discussion is a lot like leading a debrief. There are many trans transferable skills that can be used between the two. I'd like to share a few of these with you to give you some simple tools that will help you in your simulation debriefings, your clinical debriefings, and in your family conversations. We should have a plan before we go in. Ideally, we have a quick planning meeting for family conversations to share a bit of information about the family and to decide what we're going to cover and who's going to cover it. For simulation debriefing, we need to decide on the issues we want to discuss. You may want to use a structure. If you're breaking catastrophic news like a death, that needs to be right at the beginning of your conversation. Whereas in other circumstances, you might find out from the family where they're up to, then fill them in on the gaps and go on from there. Remember, if you do use a structure, remember to be flexible. You may need to change your approach halfway through a conversation. We need to find a common agenda with the people in the room. Quite a good way of finding out what people want to talk about is to ask them. There's quite good evidence that if you give families a list of questions that they might want to ask, they remember to ask the tough questions, but they also remember a lot more about the conversation as a whole. We can find a common agenda with our learners during the reactions phase of the debrief, or using a simple construct like plus delta. What went well? What could you do better? This is learner-centered debriefing. The participants identify their own learning needs. People need to feel safe so that they can raise issues and ask questions. In SIM, we call this creating a safe container for learning. Much of this we do in the pre-brief, where we clarify expectations and make a commitment to confidentiality and to respecting the learners and their psychological safety. We also need to be honest and open. Families need clear, unambiguous information and an honest appraisal of their loved one's prognosis. Learners deserve the same. If we see a performance gap, we name it, and then together we get curious about finding out why it happened. If we upset somebody, we have to acknowledge it and show empathy, not just plow on. We have to have a heart moment. I'd like to give you a little example of when thinking about head and heart moments could have helped me. I was leading a family donation discussion when the sister of the patient who was brain dead said, I just don't want her to suffer anymore. I followed my thick head and explained to her again that her relative couldn't possibly suffer because she was brain dead. I thought I was doing the right thing, but in retrospect, what she was really saying was, 
that she couldn't bear the thought of her sister having another operation. What I should have said was something like, I'm so sorry, this must be very difficult for you. This is your sister we're talking about after all. If you take away one message from my talk today, I'd like it to be this. Use silence well. Families and learners need time to process information, talk amongst themselves, vent their frustrations. They can't do this if you talk all the time. You should also use silence if you drop a grenade. If you say, I'm so sorry, Bob has died, anything you say after that for the next few minutes won't be heard or understood. Finally, a concept I've taken from simulation back into the family discussion. In simulation, we make the basic assumption that everybody who's participating is doing their best and wants to improve. If a family member is being unreasonable with you, or as Liz might say, is being a bit of a dick, cut them some slack. Make the assumption that they just want what's best for their loved one and their suffering. So armed with these tools, I would recommend going on a communication course, especially if they use professional actors, and especially if they debrief you in character. It's really powerful stuff. Alternatively, or in addition, become a sim educator. Learn about and practice debriefing. It will make you a better communicator. For me, I'm still on the journey. After debriefing sessions and difficult conversations, I seek feedback from my colleagues, always trying to improve. One final thought. These conversations are emotionally draining. And in intensive care, we might have several of them during a week. So look out for your colleagues. We can't always be strong and resilient like the bear. I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in the Big Sim project. Their names are coming up on the screen. We hope that we've shown you this week what we can achieve with simulation. But remember, you don't need an expensive mannequin or a film crew or professional actors to do simulation. It really should be accessible for all. If anyone has any questions of me, I'll be in Sim House after this. Thanks very much. <laughs>